This video is really going to help me discover how much people find me interesting to listen to because I do have to wonder how many of you are going to make it the whole way through this. Um, in the description, I will have the order in which the questions were answered. I'm not going to figure out specific times because I do think that there are worthwhile answers that everyone should listen to, not just the person who asked the question. So I'm not going to encourage watching only parts of this, but if you absolutely must skip ahead to when your question was answered, then you can use the order in the description to make a reasonable guess as to when the where the answer appears in the video. All right, so I did get a lot more questions than I expected to. I mean, if this actually, if this wasn't the holiday period, I, it might have taken me weeks to plan out my answers to some of the more profound questions I got, if I might use that word. Um, you know, mostly everything you hear me say on this channel has been planned down in advance, um, for those that don't know. Um, I like to argue the points in my mind to close off the most obvious objections to them. And also, if I did ever go unscripted and went off on irrelevant tangents, I really don't have a lot of confidence in my ability to get back to the point without having to start again. So that's why I script things out um, to a to a reasonable degree. Um, you know, scripting this one out, a video of this length, was definitely a challenge, but it got done. No real cha well, it got done. So um, let's move on. Let's move on ahead and get started with this um, Q and A. Um, the first question, well not the first question that was asked, the first question that I'm, the question that I feel is the best one to start out with was from Maryland Wolves 110 who asks, who are your favorite top 10 Noah wrestlers during the last decade and what are your top 10 Noah matches? Um, who do you think had the better run, Austin in 2001 or Triple H in 2000? And which matches from the 2000s in Japan do people overrate and underrate in your opinion? Okay, for as far as top 10 Noah wrestlers, first you have the obvious choices, you know, Mizawa, Tawe, Kobashi, Akiyama. I'll also throw Takayama's name in there, definitely. And Hashimakoto, who some YouTubers might not be aware of, but has definitely taken part in enough noteworthy matches in the 2003 to 2005 period to have a chance at top 10 Noah wrestlers this decade. And I'd also say that between the Kenta Fuji stuff, um, Kenta's better singles matches, as well as the period when Marafuji was teaming with Suzuki Minoru, I would say that would be just about enough to give that pair, Kenta and Marafuji, consideration as well. So that's only eight, I know, but there really doesn't feel like there's any more safe bets, and I only really mention safe bets when it comes to answering a question like this without doing any detailed watching, which is what I would do to get a definitive answer to a question like that. Um, as far as matches, I'm confident in Mizawa Kobashi 2003, Kobashi vs. Suzaki 2005, and the Kensuke Office vs. Kobashi Shiozaki tag from the same year are all up there. Um, I'd actually I'd actually be more confident of Kobashi vs. Akiyama from December 2000 making a top 10 than their 2004 match actually. Um, Kobashi vs. Takayama 2004, easily, easy choice there. Uh, Kobashi's 2007 return match is also another good one that could very well be up there. Um, Kobashi vs. Honda from 2003 and Tawai vs. Nagata from the same year. Uh, the Noah vs. New Japan 2002 tag from February featuring Liger and Inoue Wataru. Um, and Mizawa and Ogawa vs. Kenta Fuji from 2004 could be one of Noah's best tag matches. So. Those are all candidates, and um, you have to keep in mind, though, that my long answer to questions like this is to watch everything worthy of consideration and carefully make an ordered list. So you're going to all you're going to get from a video like this is rough, rough estimates. You know, um, Death Valley Drivers Protopia is about a year and a half away from the best of the decade in Japan vote. That will give you a reasonable answer to your question. I have contributed to the last two votes, which were 2004 and 2005. They're doing the leftovers now, and then it is overall decade stuff. So it should be pretty exciting. should be very, very exciting when they get to that point. Um, who do I think had a better run in... Two th uh, was it Austin in 2001 or Triple H in 2000? I obviously haven't... You obviously haven't um, seen me look at any Triple H 2000 matches yet. Um, just looking at match quality, uh, as I am exclusively doing these days, I would be... I'm surprised if um, Triple H had a year in, that could compete with Austin in 2001, just looking at match quality. Um, the only Triple H matches from that year that I'm especially interested in, in re-watching again, 
are the Royal Rumble Street Fight, because I'm a big Mick Foley fan, and the fully loaded Last Man Standing. You know, that was my first pay-per-view that wasn't home video back when I was getting into wrestling. So, And I loved that match at the time. So, interesting to me to see if it holds up with the way I think these days. So, um, that's the point I'd make there. And um, which Japanese matches do I think people overrate and underrate? Um, I've never really got the the praise for the main event of the first ever Zero One show, and that was Hashimoto and Nagata versus um, Mizawa and Akiyama. It got the 2001 match of the year um, from the Death Valley Driver vote, and after watching it twice over the past few months, I still think it's pretty forgettable. I mean, I can't pinpoint, pinpoint any terrible problems with it, but at the same time, nothing exceptional either. You know, but I'll probably give it enough chances to finally click with me. I just haven't got it. I just have not um, got it so far. Um, underrated, based on the two year votes that I've taken part in now, most recently, um, I think Akiyama and Hashi versus Rikyo Takeshi and Suzuki Katalo from 2004 is overrated. Not overrated, underrated, I'm sorry. Um, that's what really gets me about that Noah card. You know, that's the card that had Kobashi versus Takayama and Misawa and Ogawa versus Kenta Fuji. Um, but I also really, really got into that undercard tag match. It has, um, it features yet another very memorable performance from Hashimakoto and an effective hot tag from Likyo, one of the, the few highlights um, that I've seen of him so far. So that's an underrated match. From 2005, I'd say, again, we're going to Hashi. So Akiyama versus Hashi, their singles match from that year. I think the subtleties in that match make it a better veteran versus young lion match than the more famous Kawada versus Kojima match that took place in all Japan that year so which you would not have got from the overall results of a 2005 vote that eventually um, came out so that's another underrated one uh, and thank you for the question phenomenal hitman 5150 asks um, what do you think of Kevin Steen's current character in Ring of Honor he also asks do you follow the UK indie scene and if so what are your thoughts on it and he, his last question is, what are your thoughts on Prince Devitt, best British wrestler currently, and maybe all time? Um, I haven't seen anything that Kevin Steen has been doing, actually, um, so I can't really comment. But he does seem like a, a fine representation of the anti-establishment character that the American indie fans tend to go for. Um, especially now with the complaints over the subdued nature of the ROH product. And he obviously... And he obviously excels within that character as well you know putting some effort into making it making it authentic with the stuff that he's been doing on the message board and all that um, i wouldn't say he did a better job of the anti-establishment character this year than cm punk during the summer i mean even for someone like me who isn't particularly interested in wrestling characters at the moment um cm punk got me to watch a few weeks worth of raw episodes um so cm punk despite the lack of longevity I'd still say had a better peak than Kevin Steen with the anti-establishment character, so um, that's my take. Uh, do I follow the UK indie scene? Um, I saw maybe half a dozen UK talents when Noah came to Britain in the summer. You know, uh, Johnny Storm actually came out to status quo, rocking all over the world, which everyone sang along with. It actually, you know, gave you the impression that he was that the guy was one of the biggest attractions of the show, even though he didn't do anything at all that left a lasting impression. And, you know, Dave Mastiff challenged Segura for the GHC Heavyweight Championship on the first night. And that guy can surprise you with all his variations of the moonsault. And for a man his size, definitely. Which made that match uh, somewhat memorable as a main event. Uh, and, you know, there was Zack Sabre Jr. A guy who I was quite positive about after I watched him carry Davy Richards to what I thought was one of the best, um, one of the better indie spot fests this year in Germany. Um, he was booked against Nakajima and Kenta that weekend, and it really felt like the last thing, thing that weekend would do would be to establish Sabre as the junior heavyweight to keep an eye on now, because he was going to steal the show. And, you know, neither match was that special. And it's a shame, really, because it kind of made me lose interest in the guy altogether. You know, I still think the guy is solid. I still think... He's better than a lot of the other juniors in the Indies right now. He's someone that they should definitely be looking into signing. I mean, he got one or two tours with Noah after the UK weekend, but I'm pretty sure he's not getting any bookings there at the moment. So, you know, sign him up. You know, if I think he's solid, then the fans of the junior style will accept him with open arms. So, um, there you go. What are my thoughts on Prince Devitt, best British wrestler currently and maybe all time? The first thing I'd point out is that 
um, Prince David is Irish, and you're lucky that I'm not some sort of hyper-nationalist Irish countryman, or I might have been offended by that mistake. Um, but David is neither the best British wrestler, um, nor the best Irish wrestler going today. He's not as good as Finlay, he's not as good as Regal, you know. As long as Regal is having matches like he'd had against um, Dean Ambrose in FCW this year, I'd consider him better than David, hands down. Uh, the, best, the best British wrestler of all time is Billy Robinson. Uh, we haven't even finished going over the pre-1980s Japan footage on the forum, and I can say that he is the best British wrestler with absolute confidence. He is untouchable. Um, the thing about Devitt this year is he has really struggled to find meaning in what he's doing. And a lot of it is down to the way he's booked. You know, in 2010, whatever about the quality of the matches, it really felt like Devitt versus Marafuji was a big deal. Because they spaced the matches out very well, they gave Devitt the win at the right time, and, you know, the Devitt versus Ibushi matches this year, I don't think you're getting the same feeling from them, you know? And part of it is probably because it's an outsider chasing the belt. You know, Ibushi got the title, and he was unfortunate enough to get injured soon after that. But even if he didn't get injured, you know, how much of a long-term investment is he really? You know, guys in Japan tend to stick to their companies, so Ibushi is still DDT affiliated. Um, getting back to Devitt anyway, I said this back when the best of the Super Juniors tournament, tournament was happening. The guy needs to feud with Liger. You know, the reason is the same as it was six months ago. The way you take Devitt to the next level is you have him feud with a veteran of that division. You know, and the only other option they have is Kanemoto. And based on the cards that New Japan are putting out these days, Kanemoto really seems to be a semi-regular guy. Uh, as far as I can tell. So, you know, Liger as well also spends a lot of time in Mexico, but if they really wanted to take this seriously and make a serious feud out of it, I'd say there'd be very little problem in getting Liger in a full-time um, position to feud with Prince Devitt. You know, give both guys a faction, let it continue for a year, you you bring Devitt to the, you take the next step with Devitt that way. You know, I can't see a problem with any of that. The next set of questions are from the Mad Scientist, 7890. Um, if you could book any American wrestler to have a run in Japan, who would it be and why at any time in history? Um, in a lot of, he also asks, in a lot of people's minds, Lesnar's run in New Japan was disappointing. How would you book his run to make it worthwhile? And he also says, the older I'm getting, I've come to truly appreciate storytelling in wrestling matches. Could you suggest the matches that you consider to have the best storytelling? Okay, as far as the the American in Japan thing, I think you can place Rey Mysterio within any of the better periods for juniors wrestling, and you would manage to propel that period to even further heights. You know, that's just because Rey is one of the best guys that size at working his spots within a sound structure. You know, funny it is, even though Rey was in WCW at a time when they were exchanging quite frequently with New Japan, it doesn't look like he spent a lot of time in the country. It really doesn't. I mean, he was at the J Cup in 95, and then he spent, and he also spent some time in WAR um, as well. But he doesn't really seem to have made the impact that you imagine that he could have. You know, you, you could put him in Michinoku Pro in 96, or the Noah Juniors division from 2002 to 2004, for example, and you could have had something very special. You know, that's actually a harder question to, to think of an answer to because it's hard to find something that just feels absolutely perfect you know that feels like that that's a good idea but it feels like there's a better idea just waiting out there i couldn't i couldn't really um uh grasp it but so uh, i think that's a good um idea anyway mysterio in japan we all want to see more of that um as far as lesnar's run in new japan the thing about that was Lesnar came in at a time when Inoki was pushing the company to the brink of extinction because of his decisions. You know, this is where the term Inokiism comes from. Um, Inokiism is a booking style where you bring in shoot fighters to do works and you make your wrestlers do shoots. Um, the result of this booking severely damaged the company's credibility, and if you would like to read more about the wonders of Inokiism, then I have provided another link in the description where you can read all about it. Um, but, you know, bringing in Lesnar is on the surface a good idea, because he's clearly got enough natural talent to do both shoot and work, and he's, got also, he's also got a name from the WWE marketing machine, but what he also had at that time was an OKP clause. You know, he wasn't legally allowed to wrestle at that time. So 
that's what, that's the context that we're dealing with here. To ask me to to ask me to book Lesnar in New Japan at that time, you're basically asking me to work within everything that was going on in the company then. You know, and, I, and I'm not that patient. I'm not a miracle worker, so I'm not going to succeed in answering your question. If anyone could, I'd be interested to hear what they had to say about that. So um, there we go on that. Could you suggest the matches that you consider to have the best storytelling? This question actually leads me to direct you to another link. We are actually debating on the forum at the moment as to whether storytelling is a suitable term to use in pro wrestling. You can find the link to the topic in the description. Um, the topic is still unfinished. At least, I consider it to be unfinished. But I also consider it to be mostly a definitional battle. Effectively, that makes it a big argument just over what's the right word to use. And that makes us all who are arguing so hard over it. It makes us slightly insane, I know. But I am prepared to accept that storytelling is a phrase that is superfluous and too much based on imagination. But I haven't changed the way I look at matches. I'm just using a new word. I'm just kind of just using layout or structure, sub substituting those words for storytelling and looking at matches in more or less the same way. But taking that into account, your question now becomes what matches have the best layout? And when you change the question to read like that, it now looks like a strange question. And I think anyone watching this or listening to this will agree with that. It feels like a strange question now because it's like it's like asking what's the best layout for a song or what's the best layout for a film or something like that. And any, anyone's response to that would, would probably be well, it depends on the content, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, and, it, and I guess it's the same with wrestling. You know, the content you're going to have effectively dictates what the layout should be. And that's basically what Daniel's been arguing all along. So this question has inadvertently led to me conceding a point of argument. That's, that's interesting now. Uh, obviously, though, that doesn't excuse illogical bullshit that I always argue against. That's an example of bad content, no matter what your layout is. But that has given me something. This has given me something to think about because I still think that the layout in itself can be exciting, sometimes as exciting as the actual content. But I'm not going to start arguing this out in my mind on camera. I'm going to get back to the actual question, which I am now able to simplify to just mean what are the best matches. And the answer to that question is thankfully a lot simpler. I just have to link you to the five-star match list that I am maintaining on the form. It is absolutely and positively not finished, but if you bookmark the thread, you can get a good idea. You can watch me add to it as time goes on, and hopefully you can get a good idea from those matches of what I consider to be good pro wrestling. So there you go with that. The next set of questions are from LV5454. He asks, uh, is there any chance you will ever talk about the other pro rest promotions not named NOAA, All Japan, and New Japan in 2012? After you take away those big three, I would say Big Japan have the best chance of, being, of getting a full show review from me in 2012. The heavyweight title change from the last show was well overdue, and it offers a better chance for the Big Japan main event scene to get better and become more interesting this year. Um, the show itself, Death Vegas, was supposed to be very good. I won't be able to see it because of all the other stuff I have to watch for the 2011 list-making process. But I will be watching the most acclaimed matches from that show, definitely. Um, I th I'd say Big Japan, out of all the miscellaneous promotions, I guess you can call them, have the best chance of, getting a, of having a stacked card these days. You know, DDT really only have one stacked card a year. That's the Peter Pan show at Sumo Hall in July. Zero One would really struggle to have a stacked card with the roster they currently have. I mean, the most interesting thing that they had was Hashimoto Daichi, and I haven't heard of anything notable he's done in a long time, so um, they're not really um, lighting the world on fire. Battle Arts is gone. They had their final show in November, so what can I say? Wazir Lenai. And I figure that you're not expecting me to talk about Dragon Gate. I have no interest in that. And as much as you might like there to be more people talking about Joshi, I have very little interest in the current scene. So I would say Big Japan have the best chance of getting of getting talked about even a little bit um, in the coming year. Uh, his next question is, what is your true definition of fighting spirit when it comes to a wrestling match? Can you give us examples of this definition in any pro wrestling match from any promotion? This was actually a very interesting question to think about because... 
fighting spirit is a term that I can't remember the last time I've used it, and I can't remember the last time I've heard it used among the fan circles that I'm uh, usually a part of. But at the same time, I don't think it's a completely unsuitable phrase for pro wrestling. So in thinking about this question, I asked myself how I would interpret the phrase if I saw somebody else use it, and under what circumstances would I use it if it, if it ever came to that. So, And the answer I came to was, fighting spirit is exceptionalism. Doing something exceptional within the context of your match. And here again, I want to link to a thread that illustrates my point. This one isn't ProWest.TV, it's Death Valley Driver. And this thread happened in response to the Kenta and Nakajima matches that took place in early 2009. The second post is what I want to use to illustrate my point, illustrate what I mean by exceptionalism. The quote um, is is authored by someone who was defending the Kenta Nakajima style of wrestling a match, and the quote reads, These are just two of the baddest, toughest, athletic, never-quit junior wrestlers going all out in an ultimate battle of inner strength to see who's the stronger fighter. These aren't your average wrestlers who shouldn't put on a match like this. They can get away with it because they are the real deal. I'd imagine that most fans of Junior Style would agree with that quote. Um, here's the problem, though. It's a contextual problem. When Juniors do that back and forth, when they trade moves, when they trade moves without selling, that's their context. That's their norm, is what I might call it. That's their standard approach to the match. And it's almost like desensitization, really, because when that's the context that you present, there's no room for fighting spirit. There's no room for exceptionalism because they can't do anything that you wouldn't expect. You know, hypothetical example, the standard juniors match I just described, Kenta kicks out of Nakajima's finisher. Is that fighting spirit? Is that exceptionalism? I don't think it is. It's probably, it's probably not going to be because they've been presenting a context within their match where the moves are ineffective, you know? Now, on the other hand, Kobashi vs. Takayama 2004 has Takayama working over Kobashi's arm, thinking that his attacks will be enough to subdue the champion. But it's not. You know, Kobashi mounts a comeback, and he uses his weak arm for a lariat. That is exceptionalism. That is fighting spirit, because the context that they have been presenting is that Takayama's moves are effective. You know, Kobashi had been selling before the Lariat, and he sells after the Lariat as well because that Lariat is not enough to win the match with. It's not powerful enough. So, to win the match, Kobashi has to dig down deep, show even more exceptionalism, and use his Moonsault. You know, a move that, ha that was difficult for him to hit in his physical state at the time. So, what could possibly compel him to use it? Exceptional circumstances, yes. So that is why I'd say Kobashi vs. Takayama 2004, the finish to that match especially, had exceptionalism, and therefore fighting spirit. That's how I define fighting spirit, you know? Doing something exceptional and unexpected within your match's context. The only way you're going to get exceptionalism from the type of, the, the type of juniors match that I was describing earlier is if you really and truly believe that these guys are the absolute best athletes that you could possibly be seeing. And the problem with that is, you know, once the execution of the spots is more important than the strategizing, it's, it's very hard to compare those junior heavyweights to sport athletes anymore because sport is about strategy. So you basically have to compare them instead to the athleticism of stuntmen. And, you know, let's be honest, wrestlers aren't contortionists. You can go to a stunt show, you can watch a contortionist bend his body into all sorts of unusual positions, and you can say to yourself, you know, wow, can't believe a human being is capable of that. Um, wrestling doesn't often give you athleticism like that, unfortunately, so I don't think that's a very convincing stance to take. Um, his next question is, I find using the percentage system a bit more difficult seeing as how there are 10 part increments to each score. Um, I'm clear on what the percentages represent, aka 80% to 90%, 4 to 5 stars, but how do you, deci how do you decide the exact percent of a match? Um, I actually think that the 10 part increments can be used very simply to show which 4 star match you liked more than another 4 star match. You know, Imagine the minimum threshold for a 4 star match, you give that 80%, and then you find a match that you like just a little bit more, and you, what you want to acknowledge that you liked it just that little bit more, and then you give you give that one 81%. You know, for me, it can, for me, it can really be that simple. Um, 
the five star match list that I talked about earlier. You can tell the ones that just about made the list to the ones that are topping the list right now. So that is where the percentage system is useful. Um, but to give a bit of backstory to where this issue has its roots, I'm going to go again to uh, another link. You know, uh, I'm not sure how people feel about having to do background reading for these answers, but it really does help illustrate my points. And, you know, I spend more time on forums than I do on YouTube, so this is basically going to happen inevitably. Um, anyway, read the thread, and you'll see that the scale has been suggested. You know, Daniel suggested the unified scale because he felt that the star rating system was becoming unworkable. You know, his point was that for an outsider looking in, they have to know the reviewer's habits inside and out before they can understand just how much he likes a match. So, therefore, the usefulness of the review is greatly diminished. And I agree with that. But the way I see it, he's asking for a near miracle trying to change that. You can draw up a scale and suggest that everybody use it. You can suggest a frequency aspect on top of that. But some people just aren't going to follow a frequency aspect. It's just not going to happen. You know, for example, Matt on our forum earlier this year gave Tanahashi vs Naito from October 5 stars. That rating did not result in the match getting a lot more buzz on, you know, the match voting thread. I still haven't watched it. Um, and I think the reason for that was Matt had built up this reputation of being a bit of a mark for the New Japan style. Um, forgive me for that. So I think myself and others, this is all guesswork by the way, but I think there are reasonable deductions. I think myself and others kind of assumed in our heads that we, would not, we were not going to like it as much. And so we didn't feel the urge to watch it as we should have done when someone said that it was five stars. That wouldn't happen with someone who was very strictly following a frequency scale. And, it, and they, that person wouldn't give a match five stars unless they were absolutely confident that that match was comparable to the absolute best stuff from any point in history. You know, in a perfect world, I think that would be best. So that's what I try to do, and I'm sure that's what Daniel tries to do as well. But it's foolish to think that everyone's going to do that. You know, some people just prefer to get caught up in the moment and say, Oh my god, that was a great match. You know, you'd have to wait until the buzz dies down to get those people to have a closer look at the match. Just the way things are. Um, his next question is, this is still LV5454, um, do you think tournaments like the junior tournaments should go to single elimination format instead of the round robin formats? I find the round, I found, I find the round robin format to be somewhat confusing at times, too many shows, and I often would see the wrestlers not giving their best effort due to the amount of shows. Um, that makes a lot of sense, and I'm sure from a quality perspective, single elimination would be better. But I do think that round robin works from an image perspective. They want to make it seem sports, and from to me at least, round robin has I think has a more sporting feel to it, and it feels that way to me because. I've grown up in a country where soccer is the most is the most popular sport, and as far as I know, the major soccer tournaments all use round robin systems. So I don't know how American football works, but I do know that soccer is the more popular sport in Japan. So maybe that maybe that's just what feels like a sport tournament to them. Um, as well as that, there are booking advantages to the round robin format. You know, think about the results of the G1 climax this year. Um, MVP beat Nakamura on the first night. You know, they want to push MVP, so they gave him that win. Nakamura's credibility is not hurt because he, he's able to go on and win the tournament anyway. Um, and also the last night of the tournament, where Naito beat Tanahashi in five minutes. You know, Naito goes on to the final. He looks better as a result. Tanahashi is still the champion. He's been winning plenty of times this year for not to not look legit. So upset victories are the big advantage of having a round robin format that would be a big reason for it i think that would be a big reason why they use it um but obviously for a match quality viewpoint single elimination would be nice but it's not common i don't think lv's next question reads as much as davy richards gets criticized do you find him a little bit more acceptable when he is wrestling in new japan or another promotion that you may have seen him in well, Davey Richards in New Japan is a mid-carder in the juniors division whose matches typically go from anywhere between 13 and 18 minutes. So he keeps his worst tendencies to himself and he's also more adequate as a heel so the role he has right now in New Japan is quite suitable. Um, so that means he's definitely more acceptable 
but whether or not you think that means that he's good in New Japan is a completely different story. I still wouldn't say I have any pressing urge to watch any of his matches in the company. I'm pretty sure the last New Japan matches of his I've seen were from the Super Juniors tournament, and even the best of those were just kind of solid, I guess. You know, nothing frustrating and annoying, but nothing to jump up and down about either. At the end of the day, I just think Benoit was a far superior version of the Dynamite Kid tribute style that Davey Richards is using. If you wanted to push this point, I would put forth some of the best Benoit matches, point out everything that's good about them, and I'd be surprised if you could show me comparable quality in a Davy Richards match. Just is kind of how I feel about that. And his last question is, um, recently JWP's Yoniyama Kauli wrestled her supposed last match a few days ago. However, it is reported that she will not in fact retire. There has been a huge discussion in the Joshi community whether this was a planned act by JWP. How do you feel about a wrestler planning to retire and then decides to come back to wrestling soon after? Um, I think soon after is the key word there. I think as fans, we've been conditioned to the point where if wrestlers do come out of retirement, you know, we might grumble a bit. We might, you know, complain a little bit, but in the end, we'll accept it. You know, we'll accept it as long as it happens after a long enough time period has passed. And even sometimes that isn't even that big a deal. I mean, you know, think about Mick Foley. I'm a big fan of Foley as a sympathetic character, and I really love the feuds with Triple H in 2000 and Evolution in 2004. Uh, I know for sure that the Triple H match in at No Way Out has a retirement stipulation. The Backlash 2004 match might have had one too, don't quote me on that just yet. But Foley's never fully retired, and in the end, I accept it. You know, Terry Funk's first retirement match happened in Japan in the 1980s, in the early 80s, and the bastard's still going today. And since I'm a fan of Terry Funk, and I think that the old guy works stiff makes for a fun match, I don't care if he's still active. You know, I guess there is cause for serious complaining if you're going to do something so serious, like build a WrestleMania main event around the idea that this is Shawn Michaels' last match. But at the same time, if HBK was scheduled to wrestle for WrestleMania 28, you know, people might complain, they might grumble a bit, but I don't think anyone would refuse to acknowledge the return. I don't think anyone would refuse to watch the matches. And I don't think anyone who gave the, first, the second HBK Taker match five stars would lower their rating of it at all. So, in the end, I think it would be accepted. You know, I think that's just kind of the way it is. Um, but those are LB's questions. So, I'm now moving on to Paul Demore Johnson, who asked me, how would you have booked the 2001 Invasion? I talked a little in my Austin 2001 video about why him as a heel didn't work for business. So as much as I love his heel work that year from a match, from a match quality standpoint, if I was booking, I would have done everything I could to keep him face. Uh, that obviously means that there needed to be a killer heel for him to lock horns with. And in the absence of any more of the recognizable names from WCW, I would have settled for building up Booker T as a much, much bigger threat than what was done in reality. You know, and I, and I might not be so cruel to Diamond Dallas Page on top of that. So that's the main thing I would have done different. I'm not going to go into any more detail because it would just take too long. But the point, the main point is that WCW needed to look more like of a threat. And based on the strength of one of their guys. And Booker T was the big name that they had. So um, there is that. Now, Double Cross King, Jake, asked me... Um, what are your opinions on the usage of hardcore deathmatch wrestling in Japan and in general? Do you prefer Big Japan's way of making a division based around the style and keeping it isolated from the rest of the card? Or the style being used more for blow-offs, feuds and whatnot and reserved especially for such occasions as New Japan sometimes does? Um, in terms of how they're worked, <coughs> I think I've been pretty clear on what lazy traps that hardcore matches can fall into that I'd rather not see. Uh, I've already talked about that, but you are asking me how I, how they're about how they're used, and I would say that Big Japan, what Big Japan should be doing is using the strong BJ division as a stepping stone to working death matches, and right now it seems like things are happening rather slowly. Um, it might it might only seem so slow because Big Japan's main event scene has been so boring for so long. Uh, therefore, we, therefore we want to see guys like Sasaki Yoshihito or Okabayashi work death matches even if they're not ready for a permanent main event spot you know that's a conundrum definitely but you know working in the strong bj division certainly isn't wasted time i just say that there needs to be a clear progression if you know if there's a worthwhile for example if there's a worthwhile 
blow off to the Yoshihito Shinobu relationship, for example, then that's a good example of the sort of thing that needs to take these guys to the next level. But right now, it just seems like things are ha going sideways. You know, as much as the heavyweight title change was needed and was a breath of fresh air, it doesn't ma automatically make Big Japan a must-see product. They need to do more. Uh, but the fact that I made that point does show that you're right. You know, that keeping death matches isolated like that, Big Japan does protect the reputation of them in a sense. That's definitely true. And his second question is, which wrestlers do you think would best benefit from being put in shorter or more compact matches compared to what time they're usually given now? You know, I can keep this very short too. Um, to break it into two groups, anyone who participates in a big match on a NOAA card needs to be given less time. And the Dragon Gate big matches might be more fun if they were shorter as well. You know, I'm saying might be more fun because the Lutares guys still need to create a sense of escalating energy that doesn't automatically come with a tighter time frame, but it's much easier to achieve with a tighter time frame. You know, it's much more likely that they'll produce better matches under those conditions. They've tried to take things to another level so much with their high spots that I I don't think we'll see them put together another match as well as they did on the July 3rd, 2005 tag, which I rewatched recently, and I would agree with those who say that it's the best Dragon Gate match, based on what I've seen. It's a damn, damn good match. Um, next up, we have Defying Gravity 503. Um, he asks, is it okay for a heel tag team to work over the big man of the face team, and then for the big man to hot tag his smaller partner? Well. The first thing I'd say to you is, you're asking me a question that's based completely on fantasy booking, so the only, an the only answer I can give you is based on imagination. I'll just point that out. And as I imagine it, the scenario you've described could very well work. Um, imagine the big man of the face team going in with all this momentum, all this build-up, and then the heel team cheats at the start of the match to get the advantage and work over the big man. To me, the, the, the dynamic of that match is now... Oh my god, the big the guy with all the size benefits is now the one with a disadvantage. How can this how can the faces possibly win now? So the workover portion of the match is interesting and the hot tag is also interesting because you wonder if the smaller guy has enough in him to beat these cheating heels, you know. And if he's charismatic enough, he can make you believe. And you'll be satisfied as a fan, and the match will probably be considered good as a result. So that's how I imagine it. Um, it's interesting to think about that one. Um, his second question was, if you could ask Vince McMahon any question, any one question, what would it be and why? Um, I would ask him how much personal feelings and business coincide for him in making decisions. I mean, for example, was the Katie Vick thing something that he himself personally thought would make good television? Or did he honestly think that it was good business because that's what the most, that's what the majority of his fan base wanted to see? <laughs> You'll notice that there doesn't really seem to be a good answer he can give to that question, but that is the beauty of the question. Um, and, but I would also ask him if, there, if he has any regrets. You know, if he had the chance to do something all over again, would he do it? You know, because then he can admit to his mistakes, uh, and then he can, you know, sh show a bit of his humanity. The question, the other question, doesn't allow him to do that. But that's what I would ask him. And his neck, um, defying gravity's. Uh, final question for now is um, what's your opinion about the storyline a couple of years ago between Go Shiyazaki and Akatoshi Saito um, revolving around Go wanted to, wanting to have revenge for what happened to Mizawa in June 2009 and obviously Daniel has already replied to this comment um, correcting the idea of what the story was um, Saito was never the heel during this time he got a lot he got a lot of sympathy for and a lot of crowd support for what after what happened if you were to ask me, maybe, do I think Saito's grief should be displayed out in public, then I would say that's, not, that's none of my business, you know. I really doubt that Noah forced him to, to, into any public displays of grief, so if it's his choice, then good for him to be able to express his sorrow. And I'm sure being around the very supportive Japanese crowds at that time was very helpful to him, so that's all I have to say about that. Next, we have Bigger 310 who asked me, you have recently said that ProRes is no longer appealing to you like it once did. I know you mentioned burnout and watching a lot of the product, but more specifically, was there an event or action that really started your disinterest? Um, no specific event or disinterest or dis... No, no specific event or action. It was just watching the older stuff. 
I know that I know that makes me sound like a stereotypical Mark who misses the Attitude Era, but I'm coming at it from a completely different perspective. And from what I from what I'm watching right now, it is true. You know, wrestling was better in the 90s and in the 80s and so on. I'll still watch the matches that interest me from the current product, and I'll still take part in voting for match of the year candidates on the forums that I frequent. But as far as extended interest in talking about the current scene or following any company religiously. I don't want to do that anymore when there's so much good stuff from the past, you know, that I have seen and that I still have yet to see. That's much more exciting to me right now. So that is why my disinterest on the current scene is stronger than it was. Um, his second question is, if you could book any company from any two year time frame, which would you choose and why? Like I said earlier, I th if I thought I was a miracle worker, then I would try to book New Japan from 2004 to 2005. Um, could I make a Nokiaism work? Would I have to try something else? Could I possibly choose better talent to push to the top than who Inoki was choosing during that time? There's a lot of interesting possibilities for someone trying to book that period of New Japan. But if you are booking it, you have to try. If you are taking the approach of trying to correct the mistakes that Inoki made during that time, then you pretty much have to try to understand his motivation behind that decision, behind each decision, which isn't easy and would take a lot of patience. And if there's any other factors that influence him to make that decision, then you have to consider that too. So as much as I would be interested to see what differences I could come up with for that period of New Japan, I don't think I like the idea of the journey it would take to get me there. I really don't think I'm up for it. Um, but I still think that's one of the most, most interesting periods for booking in any pro wrestling company ever. You know, not for good reasons, but it was a newsworthy time for them. So that's the answer to your question. Um, now we have a bunch of Sanders Robin questions, a lot of these, and some interesting um, answers um, in the in the works now. Um, you've admitted that your taste has evolved from WWE to Ring of Honor to Chikara to uh, ProRes over the last few years. You even seem pretty down on some of the pro, pro the pro ProRes promotions this year. Do you see yourself totally losing complete interest in the business next year, or will Will you possibly another style of wrestling spark your interest in the future? Um, I don't see myself losing interest at all, actually, because even though the current pro wrestling scene is very limited, it has given me a good idea of what I want wrestling to be. Uh, that still that still applies, and I know that wrestling, I know that the wrestling I like to see is definitely out there. There's just not a lot of it happening right now. Uh, but some of the stuff from the past is just so great to watch. And I don't see my current taste in wrestling taking any big change. Because right now I feel very, very confident in what I consider in what I consider to be good wrestling. You know, it's the arguments in favor of something else that will get me to look at things in a different way and get me to enjoy a different kind of wrestling. So, and as you can probably tell, I still think the arguments in favor of what I like are the strongest arguments out there. You know, matches that use great selling as the means for drama, matches that don't waste time, uh, matches that hold up as time passes. You know, I'll be able to point to, I'll be able to point to what makes that match great, and anyone that wants to argue otherwise has to say something convincing to change my to change my mind. You know, I was recently accused of being over analytical, and I'll link you to that video. And this is actually related to another question that you asked me. Um, this fellow accused me of being over analytical, and one of the reasons he gave why this was a bad thing is because that is because I ruined the Kai versus Omega match for him. That's pretty much a clear indication that he was not confident in the match's quality. You know, otherwise he would have been able to say, "No, he was wrong about that. They did this part of the match well, and that's why I liked it." But th but that's not what he said. Instead, he said he didn't enjoy the match as much after listening to what I said. Therefore, he must have thought my points made at least some sense. You know, whether he was happy about the fact that they made sense or not is another story, but I don't expect to lose interest in wrestling. Because right now, I have plenty of confidence in the strength of my own opinions. That's why. Sanders Robbins' next question is, You have been one of the first guys to call out ROH out for their lack of personalities and dull storytelling in the ring. Now that there are more people that feel the same way, do you think it has to do with ROH fans just being spoiled because of the great history of talent compared to the current roster? Or do you just believe that the company has completely lost its eye for talent? Um, as far as the more people feeling the same way thing, 
I have not seen the main event of the final battle show, and I imagine that I never will, but to the people that are criticizing that match for the reasons that they are, I would be very interested if all of them rewatch the first Edwards Richards match and still give it a perfect rating. Because if they do that, then I will just feel more confident in the point that I made a few months ago, which is the biggest thing that people liked about that first match was the fact that Davy Richards won. Not anything that actually happened in the match, because that match had no structure, that match had selling problems, that match had all the stuff that people are complaining about in the final battle match, and people are also saying that despite the whole Dan Severn story heading into final battle, Eddie Edwards wrestled in the exact same way. And I'd be very surprised if Davy Richards did anything different from what he usually does either. So if they had the same type of match, then I don't know what people are thinking. Are people just confused or are they just insisting on rating that best in the world match based on just just based on who won it? That's my take on that. Um, as far as the eye for talent thing, it definitely seems that way because I would rate Danielson, McGuinness, Aries, Punk, those guys comfortably higher than I would Davy Richards, Eddie Edwards or Roderick Strong. I think a couple of things to keep in mind though is that one, you can make an argument that there's, you can make an argument that there's a lack of talent to pick up with MMA attracting a lot of young athletes. And also the lack of exciting storylines in Ring of Honor at the moment, I think, is still a fair point for this. I mean, last year when the last Steen and Generico match happened, I made the point that the ongoing feud made the craziness of the whole thing, it made it work. Now, the wrestling taste that I was just starting to develop at that time have consolidated quite a bit since then so I don't think that me personally at the moment would enjoy a match more because of that but I do still think that it's a valid point for the American wrestling crowds who do appreciate the storytelling the storylines probably more than I do at the moment so that's point number two and point number three is road agents you know perfect example Tyler Black, a.k.a. Seth Rollins, a guy who offered very little outside of the standard junior spots in Ring of Honor, he goes to the WWE, and by all accounts, I have not seen the matches yet, but by all accounts, he works a smarter match than we have ever seen him work before against Dean Ambrose. I think it was Daniel who called that one of the best ROH-flavored matches he'd ever seen, although he did give most of the credit for that to Ambrose. But So the difference could be a difference in road agents. The guys that are putting together the matches in Ring of Honor could be lacking at the moment. I can't present that present that as anything more than a guess because I obviously don't know how the system works, but someone's putting together those matches and they're not getting the same results that they did with Danielson or McGuinness, etc. Um, you know, think about the difference between Kurt Angle in WWE and Kurt Angle in TNA. This is another point I heard made recently. Kurt Angle in WWE, as much as I have been identifying him as the weaker link in many of the matches that I've been, been seeing of him, could time his spots much better in the WWE. And that's a credit to the WWE road agents. Um, I do hope that the criticism against Ring of Honor continues to catch on, because Finley is out there. Finley is out there. Finley is available, and he's done the road agent thing in the WWE. That guy just won the main championship in Smash, okay, but that just means maybe one or two Japanese dates a month. You know, Davey Richards spends more time in Japan, and he's your champion. I mean, if Ring of Honor picks up Finlay, they'll be better off. I don't imagine any scenario where that won't be true, so that's a point that everyone should keep in mind there. And Sanders Robbins' next question says, In the past, you've talked about how no one needs an outsider to save the company from their financial struggles, and that hasn't happened. It seems like the heavyweight division is filled with guys who have already had their run. Do you ever see Kenta, Malafuji, or Nakajima domin dominating the heavyweight division in the future? Even if it seems like a risk, do you think that the company would pretty much draw this around the same number of people? Um... They'll definitely draw the same number of people if they, put, if they push those guys to the forefront. The problem is, the same number of people for Noah right now is not an impressive number at all. And it's even more worrisome because every other promotion seems to be stabilizing. I'm, go <clears throat> I'm going to link you to an article that David Ditch wrote for ProRes Pulse a while ago. It's very compact and it gives you a very easily readable summary of the state of Japanese wrestling right now. It'll give you a clear insight into why the business has bottomed out um, over the last year or two. And the numbers he's quoting from Dave Meltzer show that the attendance patterns, they show a, they show a pattern, um, basically. All Japan are stable. 
New Japan are stable. DDT have drawn 8,000 for their Sumo Hall show for the past three years. Dragon Gate is more than stable. They're doing quite well. And Inoki's name will keep bringing people to the Gnome Federation shows. Um, NOAA is the only company that draws the sort of attendance that would make people cringe. And they drew better attendance for the last Ariake show, the one I reviewed. They, they claimed 200 short of 6,000 for that. Um, I don't know if that's because Kobashi was there or because Kenta was in the main event. But I'd imagine whatever's in the main event would be a bigger influence over people coming to that show. So, like I said, having Kenta, Nakajima and Malafuji in the main event isn't going to drive them into a bigger hole than what they already are in, but nor is it going to get them back to selling out Nippon Bodokan or even thinking about going back to the Tokyo Dome again. You know, obviously obviously, there's no alternative to Kenta Marafuji that's available right now that has a better chance of getting that job done. You know, you can read all about it in Ditch's article. Uh, but Noah doesn't have that many options. So Kenta and Marafuji are just comfortable choices for Noah to get to plod along with. That's what they represent. And I'm not going to get too excited about that because I'm a fan of heavyweight wrestling. So, you know, Nakajima might represent something a bit more if he gains some mass and moves up to heavyweight, but you know, one guy's not going to do it. You know, that that's a that's a bit of a depressing answer, but um it wouldn't do well to live in a isol isolated fantasy land where Noah is doing big business right now. So that's all I have to say about that. And uh, Sanders Robbins' last question actually makes me feel rather warm and fuzzy inside, but I'm going to read it anyway. Um, many people would agree that you are one of the, easily one of the most intelligent and original wrestling-related video makers. However, you are very strict and somewhat picky when it comes to praising matches. Do you think that the over-constructive criticism of matches has turned a lot of people off from your channel? Does it bother you that when you when people would agree that you are possibly the smartest of the YWC, but are still extremely underrated compared to guys like T-Slay and Spinnernet? Well, obviously, I've already talked about an example of someone who was turned off from my channel because of what he called over-analysis. And like I said, I have no sympathy for someone who is affected by my videos that way because to me, that just indicated a total lack of confidence in his own opinion. You know, it might sound a little arrogant, but when I he, when he said that I had ruined the match for him, he was basically admitting that I, what I had said had made at least some sense. So whether he wanted to admit that or not, but here's the thing. People can claim over-constructive criticism all they like. I honestly think it's as simple as asking yourself what's happening in the match right now and why is it happening? And if there's no coherent answer to those questions, that means that they're just wasting time in the ring. And keep in mind that I have praised short matches as having just as much chance of being all-time great as anything else. Something That's something that other people on YouTube might not agree with to that extent, but at the very least, they can look at a short match and say, wow, you know, no waste of time. They packed everything they could in there. They don't. They didn't need to go any longer, so I can give credit to that for what it was. You know, I do think that I've helped spread that mindset just a little bit to my small audience. Um, whereas before, you might have heard something like, it wasn't long enough to be special. If something wasn't special, the fact that it wasn't a long match was probably one of the last things that was wrong with it. You know, it wasn't special because the work wasn't good enough. Simple as that. Um, I'd like to throw in a link at this stage again, to this time to a match that I've mentioned before, uh, Funaki Mazakatsu versus Nakano Tatsu from UWF in 1989. Um, it's just about 10 minutes long. I gave it four and three quarter stars and watch it, and I don't think I have, I have to tell you why it's so great. So I think giving credit to the shorter matches shows that something does not need to have a lot of carefully constructed positives t for it to get a positive response from me. Um, as far as being underrated in the YWC, I don't think it was a big audience for what I have to say. And there are three big reasons for that. Um, the first reason is the manner in which a large percentage of the people on here tend to approach the people they disagree with. You know, I think some people think about the YWC as a collection of specific fan groups. You know, WWE fans, TNA fans, Ring of Honor fans. And that's not a problem in of itself. The problem is that people tend to rationalize the way others think based on what group they see those others as being part of. So, for example, that person gives that pay-per-view that rating 
Not because it was a good pay-per-view, not because it was a bad pay-per-view, but be just because that person is a fan of this promotion and not a fan of that promotion, that other promotion. That's how I see a lot of the rationalizing work, and the reason that's a problem is because the debate that results from disagreements over how good a pay-per-view was, for example, under those conditions, they tend to be, they tend not to focus on what the pay-per-view did right or wrong. It tends to focus on the mannerisms of a certain group of fans. For example, how biased were this certain group of fans in judging that show? You know, Final Battle 2011, the debate is not focusing on the show I, as, I, as I see it. It's focusing on whether the ROH fans reacted suitably to the show. And I don't think that's worthwhile because I don't care what people's feelings are. I don't. Uh... I want to present an argument, get a counter-argument in response, and debate over who has the best points. So a good percentage of people tend to debate in a way that is different from me. Um, therefore, it follows that I will not have a large audience. Uh, part two is related to that a little bit. Um, it, it has to do with how people overuse the word subjective. They want to constantly defend their right to, ha to see things differently, but they're not putting enough emphasis on why they see things differently. You know, I think some people see this website as just a place where we can share our opinions, but not try and shape other people's. You know, so, so what their idea of the website is, this person gives their opinion, the other person gives theirs. So you know, we might learn something interesting about the other person, but in the end, the ideal resolution is that we just agree to disagree. That's not the ideal resolution for me, because I think, I by no means think that my opinions are beyond, are beyond changing. I don't think I've heard every viewpoint. I don't think I've, heard, I've thought about everything from every possible angle. So when I argue with someone, I'll find it interesting if I think there's a possibility that that someone might cause me to think about something differently. So if I want to argue with them and keep arguing until we reach a resolution that both of us can agree on, maybe one of us has changed our mind about something along the way. Um, now, of course, that doesn't always happen. In, in fact, I'd say more often than not, that there is no resolution. Uh, and at that point, I'd say, yes, we have to attribute the lack of resolution to subjectivism. But at least we've tried to, ch to change each other's minds about something. I don't think a lot of people are trying to change each other's minds about stuff. I think they'll make points, sure, but they'll try to make them in a way that doesn't threaten the other person's opinion. I see a lot of opinions that I would like to threaten. I see a lot of opinions that I'd like to murder and never see again. And it's perfectly possible to do that without, without going personal with someone, without insulting someone, without getting on bad terms with someone. So I think people need to realize that. You know, that's problem number two. That limits my audience, I'd say, because I think a lot of people don't think that I understand subjectivism. And whereas the people who think that are essentially saying that I don't want to think about things differently. I have this opinion that I have now, and no one has the right to tell me that I can't have it. So that's how I think people are maybe um, uh, missing the point. And lastly, the last thing to point out about this is my content. You know, I talk almost exclusively about the value of matches and that won't resonate very well with the group of people that are still, that are continuing to argue that storylines and characters are more important in wrestling than matches. And because that argument continues, I would say that the principal debate on here is still wrestling ability versus everything else. You know, people who take part in that debate are the ones that are going to get the audience and people and I don't really care about that debate so as a result I fall under the radar although if I might make, if I might make a comment about the current status of that debate I feel like even though there's been some videos made about it this year they haven't really advanced the discussion from where it was you know this time last year for example I think it's basically at the same deadlock than it was a year ago if you want my advice I think that the people arguing in favor of match quality are leaving a hole in their argument that hasn't been focused on enough. Um, those in favor of match quality like to say, well, MMA is popular right now, so that should tell you that people want to see great athletes, therefore wrestling ability is a very important thing. The problem with that argument though is that a large portion of the people who are watching MMA now, they aren't refusing to watch WWE because the WWE aren't pushing the best wrestlers. They're refusing to watch the WWE because, quite simply, wrestling is fake. And to me, 
WWE could push a guy with so much natural talent that wrestling fans would be arguing with MMA fans about him. They could say, hey, this guy has so much natural talent. This guy has as much natural talent as Lesnar. He could fight in MMA and achieve as much success as Lesnar had. So why aren't you watching this guy? And I honestly believe that the MMA fan would reply, he does a fake sport, so who cares? You know, doesn't matter how good the guy looks, he's still doing a fake sport. That's what their mindset will be. And because of that mindset, who's to say that wrestling shouldn't try to go for a completely different audience than MMA? You know, I'm talking about American wrestling, Japanese wrestling is different, but with the US stuff, who's to say that they shouldn't put even more emphasis on storylines and characters and try to build their audience on the strength of that? Instead of trying to push athletes that are supposedly as legit as the top guys in MMA, whereas the MMA fans will just never trust them. That seems like a reasonable argument to me. And it's an argument that I've seen PS Power make before, but it hasn't really been tackled as much as I think it should be. So that's, I, and I really think a debate over that is how you take the whole issue of wrestling ability versus everything else to the next level. But until that whole debate is at least partially solved, there's no place for me in the more popular echelons of the YWC. Because right now I don't care about wrestling storylines that much. I just don't. Uh, I'm getting my excitement through... I'm getting my excitement right now from the drama of the wrestling match, and I'd imagine that a great number of people think that I'm focusing on the less important aspects of wrestling when I talk about that. So that's how I'd answer your last question, and thank you for the kind words in that last question. Um, now we move on to Sabu TNA Forever, who asked me, Benoit or Guerrero, who do you think is the better wrestler? And that's a very hard question. Uh, it's the sort of question that I don't like to give a definitive answer to unless I've had a very detailed look at both guys' careers. I'll just say this. I think both guys were fantastic. I think Benoit had great dramatic selling as a babyface. I think with his aggressive strikes, he had it in him to control a match effectively when he was a heel, even though I have yet to see a great example of that. Uh, the most recent great match of Benoit's that I have seen was against Finlay in jo at Judgment Day 2006. Um, the best Benoit match I've seen so far. Finlay was slightly better in it though, and Benoit was actually the face in that match. But still, you know, Benoit's timing for comebacks is superb. Um, Eddie Guerrero, again, could play a great babyface and a great heel. The most recent match of his I've seen is the Mysterio match on SmackDown 2005. I'm pretty sure that was the first match they had after WrestleMania 21. Um, Eddie is great at controlling that match. Incidentally, Rey's comebacks in that match are also great. That's a top 10 match for both guys' career, maybe top 5. So I'm very, very positive about both guys. But I couldn't possibly give you an answer as to which one is better. Um, Sabu Tine Forever also asks, which diva or knockout needs to stop acting like she knows how to wrestle? You are asking the absolute wrong person this question because I have done a very good job of avoiding watching any Divas or Knockouts for a very long time. So I cannot even try to give you an answer on that one. Um, and, he, and his third question is, which five guys from DGUSA or Evolve would you like to see in Ring of Honor? I don't have five, and I honestly don't really care about talent movement in the US Indies. Although the guys that I do like are pretty spread out. So if there was ever a situation where they all happened to find their way into one company at the same time, then I could say that I care about talent movement in the US. But right now, I'd say ROH would be slightly more interesting to me if Sammy Callahan was there. Maybe Brody Lee. But even those guys who I like, I don't think they necessarily are good enough to carry some of ROH's current main eventers to good matches. You know, like I said earlier, whichever indie company gets Finley on board on a regular basis will be better off than what they were before. He's the guy to get right now. He's the guy to pick up right now, more than any other in my opinion. So... I would like more and more ROH fans to start spreading that message because I think it would be a very, very valuable thing. Um, Sabatini Forever's last question is, what did you think, what do you think, who do you think is the worst Ring of Honor champion of all time? Again, this isn't a question that I'd be good at answering, but I'll just point out that even Ring of Honor fans are talking about how Davey Richards hasn't had one memorable title defense yet. And after six months as champion, if he doesn't, if he goes much longer without having one, he might be considered a failure. So, but if you're really asking me the wrong, you're really asking the wrong guy this question. So I'll just stop talking right there. Um, the next question is from N2V4D. Um, what is your favorite wrestling company of all time? 
All Japan Pro Wrestling in the 1990s. You know, you'll get you'll get that answer from countless other people, but you can't argue with quality. You know, and that's what they had constantly for that decade. You know, that the style got more frustrating as they tried to take things to a new level continuously, but still, they had they still had a very respectable level of qual level of quality when at the time of the Noah split. So, there you go. Um, the next question is from Carl Zero from Diwali. And he asks, how much does a spot-filled, no-selling finish hurt a good match? I.e. Richards versus Edwards 3. I see a lot of people rating it 4 stars and above. I don't even feel like it deserves 3 stars due to the lack of selling in the last 5-10 minutes. Um, well, obviously I have no plans to watch the latest Edwards versus Richards match. But here's my take. Most matches these days, pretty much all matches these days, the last third of the match... Is dedicated to dramatic tension over the finish and as, that is something that David Ditch has pointed out on Death Valley Driver it didn't used to be that way you can watch Japanese stuff from the 70s and the 80s as we have been doing on ProRest.TV and you'll see that a lot of those matches went straight from the body of the match to the finish no near falls no real indication that the match was about to end none of that and then it just does so it's a moot point whether the fans back then you know noticed how strange that was but these days we're used to the last third of the match being used for dramatic tension over who's going to win and that's a good thing it's no question about it it's absolutely absolutely a good thing uh, matches these days just can't escape that format and the problem is there's a lot of examples of match endings just going too long you know you stop caring before before the match is over you know dragon gate does this all the time but the larger problem for me isn't that. The problem is just de just is just depending on the finish to produce a good match. Noah has done this several times this year. And that's how I describe the first Edwards vs. Richards match. I thought the finish of that match was good. Didn't think there was anything overkill about it. But there was nothing about the body of that match that made the finish any more enjoyable. You know, my feelings on that match can be summed up like this. I liked the first few minutes and then nothing of any significance happened for the next 25 minutes, and then I liked the finish. That's what the match was to me. So, yes, you are correct that a spotty, no-selling finish can hurt the match when it goes too long, but a lot of Japanese headliners these days, as well as a lot of indie workers, I guess, need to realize that the middle of the match is important as well. So, that's my take on that. Um, next set of questions are from Gold Standard 000. His first question is, who has more potential to be a top guy, Dolph Ziggler or Cody Rhodes? I'd say Ziggler has a better chance, but really neither guy scream main adventure at me. I mean, Cody Rhodes' presentation is just so bland, even though he's pretty confident on the mic. Um, I'd say Ziggler would need a very capable manager to have any chance of making it really big. I mean, Vicky Guerrero is good up to a point, but... I tend to think that it's all her heel heat, and Ziggler just happens to be with her at the time. That's not what you want. So I don't think either guy are really the ones to get behind, as much as I like to watch Ziggler in the ring, but I don't know. Um, it could happen for either of them. It just really depends on how things um, play out. Um, his second question is, what do you feel is hurting the WWE more? The lack of great storylines or the lack of good characters and why? Obviously, both are very dependent on the other, but I would say the characters are the more important bit. I mean, if you get your guys 100% and undeniably over, and your booking is just good enough so it doesn't hurt their credibility, the fans would probably be on board, I'd say. I think a good example of that is WWE in 1999. You know, 1998 saw Austin, Foley, Kane, and lastly, The Rock get over. They are over, they are over undisputedly and undeniably and yet a lot of people point to 1999 as a year with a lot of rehashed and unmemorable storylines so that tells me that WWE's booking that year was acceptable enough for guys to be protected as main eventers and it put the guys in the positions that fans wanted them to be in but the booking wasn't so good that in the sense that we were getting good storylines that year so now, obviously, the booking got a lot better in 2000, so I wouldn't imagine that such a period of mediocre booking could get you by for too long. But if you were, if you have the good characters, I think you'll get by to a certain point with mediocre booking. That's what I'd say, because you you can't argue with you know the the, the success the success of the Attitude Era, and 1999 was a part of that. So uh, you can't argue with that. 
Um, his last question, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, last question. Um, what is the best way to book an angle in wrestling? Example, underdog story, invasion, intense hatred feud, family storyline, etc. I don't think there is any best way. It just depends on the characters you're using. But I've always loved a good underdog story. I've already expressed several times my appreciation for Mick Foley in this video. Um, to me, he is the best at making you feel sorry for him without making himself look like a complete non-threat in the ring. He could still brawl his heart out and get you behind him, even when the reality was he had very little chance. So, the underdog story is my favourite, personally, but I don't think there's any best way of getting a guy over. It just depends on the, the character. And there's another question here from Defying Gravity 503 he asks, do you think Bad Intentions was the best tag team in all of pro wrestling this year? Why or why not? Um, they've had the most success, definitely, but and this month marks 18 months since they've, ha they've been the IWGP Tag Team Champions. And it's been a six-month reign as the GHC Tag Team Champions. You know, there's actually, I think, a quite a fair chance that they're going to lose the, IW the IWGP belts at Wrestle Kingdom. But as far as being a, the best tag team... I'm still supporting Sekimoto and Okabayashi for that distinction. They had a lot of fun matches during the first half of the year. They fell off the radar there for a little while, but by all accounts, the Old Japan vs. Big Japan feud has gotten more interesting within the past month with the matches that Sekimoto and Okabayashi have been having against Suwama and Soya Takumi, which I, who I haven't really seen much of yet, but I'm looking forward to checking out those matches. So, And I'm sure those matches will be, will be good enough to cement Sekimoto and Okabayashi for from Big Japan Pro Wrestling as the tag team of the year. Um, I think we're getting to the towards the end now. Um, King Andy 1982 asks me, "Do you believe that the now and then comparisons between wrestlers of the past and present, i.e., Cena is the new Rock, Punk is the new Austin, Danielson is the new Brett, etc., are valid, or has wrestling changed too much for there to be comparable um, similarities between the stars of then and now?" Um, honestly, if I was trying to get behind any of the stars of today, I wouldn't try to rationalize my enjoyment of them by ref by referring to past names, because that's not a legacy. Um, that's just trying to appreciate somebody based on how much they're similar to somebody else, to a real legend, um, essentially. I mean, anyone who's, anyone who's not a fan of Cena can very reasonably say, oh, you know, he's just a second-rate version of The Rock. Uh, and fine, I won't argue whether or not that's true or not, but if it were true... I'd say that that's a reasonable complaint. But if anyone was a fan of Cena and said that they were a fan of him because he reminded them of The Rock, then I'd be wondering how much of an impact Cena's really had on those fans. You know, I'm not I'm not arguing for originality because everyone takes influences from everybody else. From everyone takes influences from the the stars of yesteryear. But all I'm saying is that anybody that's going to become a real legend should have a legacy that stands on its own. That's how I feel. Uh, then Daniel, uh, Talks Pro Rest, had um, some questions. How have you changed as a pro wrestling fan in the last few years? And what caused, influenced, or sparked those changes? I already feel like he knows the answer to both of those. And anyone who's been following this channel for a long enough time should know as well. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, I actually did a little summary of it in my last Noah review video. And why my tastes have changed to the, to the degree that they have. Um, the reason why curiosity to watch everything that I could and then the the desire to decide what was better and I think I have clearly made that decision um, uh, in the last year or two um, his third question was do you enjoy wrestling more as a result of this more or less as a result of this that's like this is a question that he might have genuinely been curious about but I already have effectively answered it in my responses to Sanders Robbins question so I think Daniel should feel informed already about how much I'm enjoying wrestling right now so um, I think I can uh, put that one pretty much to the side as well the last the next to last question is from FN Mr. Moonlight and he says oh here's a question that I have a hard time to answer and I'm still not very happy with the answer is there any formula or recipe for a match to be good I mean can we say that from the moment a match has this and that it will certainly be a good match. And if we can, what are those this and that? In other words, yeah, you need other words, sorry. Um, what are the qualities required universally to make a good match, if there is any? 
and what are the flaws that will turn any cocktail of wrestling elements into something bad. Obviously different matches will have different strengths, but I believe that good selling is what facilitates mostly every strength that a pro wrestling, pro wrestling match can possibly have. If you have a memorable moment in your match, the reason it was memorable is because of the way the guys were selling up to that point. It allowed it to feel special. Exceptionalism, as I, as I talked about earlier. If you have an especially stiff strike in the match, then the way it's sold is what makes it work. If you have a believable near fall, then it's because the move was sold, and the moves leading up to it were sold as well. So selling isn't a strength in of itself, but it is what is needed to allow the match to have strengths at all. So that is what I'd say is a universal quality um, for a match to be good, that every match should have if it's going to be considered good. That's my answer to that. And the last question, I left this until last on purpose, comes from... WWE Rules 85, I want to get into current pro rest wrestling, what is the best way to follow it? I left this question until last so I could do some more shameless pimping of the forums that I participate in and the websites that I go to. The first one is ProLove.com, it's the website to visit when you want to keep up with results. The results are posted as soon as the show is over, as, and for some of the big shows even, they post the ongoing results as the show is happening. And in addition to that, they post the schedules for shows in the future. So not just not just when they're happening, but when they're going to air on TV. So you know when to be looking out for it to appear on the internet, basically. Um, don't be put off by the fact that it's a German website. You don't need to understand German to understand the results. And the only news they post is probably stuff that they have been they that Dave Meltzer has already reported, basically. So they don't have any exclusive news that would make you wish you could read German to um, understand. It's a valuable resource for all of us that follow Japanese wrestling. Mostly everything of pro rest these days is uploaded by some group called Rudos. I'm pretty sure that it appears first on the major torrent sites, whatever they upload. And then it appears as a mega upload or, very recently, a file serve link on the major wrestling discussion forums. So if you're going to be, if you're part of a forum that has a multimedia section, check and see if they post the Rudo's release. And if you're not part of a forum yet, then come and join us at ProRest.TV. We have a multimedia section for you to come and grab shows from. And while you're there, you might as well join in on the, in all the discussion that goes on on the forum. Another major form is Death Valley Driver. They've been around forever. Um, I do warn you, though, it's not the easiest place to get your account validated uh, on. So you can very e you can actually post when the account is validated. The only problem is it just, it can take a while to get validated. I tried quite a few times to get it registered, and it never happened. I would probably still be trying if it didn't if I didn't become a part of ProRes.TV. So now that I am a part of that form, I'm not really trying for the other one anymore. Although I am now taking part in the best of year lists. And if you don't like downloading shows, then the current YouTube uploader of ProRes shows is Senor ProRes. He's been moving to new accounts quite a lot lately because he keeps getting flagged for copyright. But he's always considerate enough to post a message to his subscribers directing them to the new account. So it's quite easy to keep up with him. And he uploads every major, all the major pro rest shows, and quite a large percentage of the smaller shows as well. So that um, those are all the links that I would um, recommend to someone just getting into pro rest. So uh, that was a marathon of a video, wasn't it? You know, that was the most. This was the most enjoyable one I've done in a while, and I'm hoping that some of my answers here lead to something that might prompt more videos on these topics because a lot of the questions here were really good definitely and got me thinking quite a bit so thank you to everyone who sent in questions and i look forward to getting your feedback